Hi, and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Northboro, um, the COVID-19 edition. Uh, if you haven't seen this show before, my name is Art Bergeron. I'm an elder law attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell, but this show is not about elder law. It's about my friends, Frank and Mary. Once again, their goal is to live in their house until they, till they die and be buried in the backyard. And during COVID-19, they're kind of stuck in the house all the time. So they really want to know, and maybe you want to know, kind of what's going on in your town, how everyone is dealing with all these issues. And so as, if, if you've seen the show before, you know that my wonderful co-host uh, is Chris Linquist from the library. Thanks very much for being back, Chris. Good morning, Arthur. How are you? Just great. And Chris continues to find great people um, that you may want to be knowing and, and hearing from regarding what is going on in your hometown. And 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 uh, Chris, I think you've got a wonderful person here today. We do. So we've got Greg Martineau, who's the superintendent of schools. And um, Greg is here to kind of talk about, I, I guess we're calling it the new abnormal now and, and what's happening in terms of remote learning and, and how the, the kids and parents are coping with this, Greg. So, you know, maybe you can just give us a brief uh, kind of overview of what's been happening since the schools closed. Sure, absolutely. So first of all, thank you for having me as a guest. I will truthfully uh, share that I have not watched the show, um, <laughs> but, I, but I will go on to YouTube and actually look at some past shows. And I think the verdict is out if I'm a great guest, we'll have to decide that after the half hour <laughs> show. Um, so. <laughs> But again, this is an excellent opportunity. Well, we'll, see how, we'll see how many people we'll see how many people watch the reruns of your show. Yeah, your maybe show. this will go viral. So <laughs> usually, my, usually my messages don't go viral, but maybe maybe this will be the the chance I have. So again, thank you for having me as a guest, and I greatly appreciate it. And um, I think the favorite part of my job as a superintendent is to interact with uh, family, students, parents, and citizens of of the wonderful community of Northboro. Um, because it really um, helps me get a sense of um, what the issues are and what people are thinking about and how we can do the best job possible as a public school. So like most people um, across uh, the country, um, the school department and our students and families have experienced COVID firsthand and, and the results of, of this pandemic. I think that we um, initially, we're watching the radar uh, in terms of what was happening across the globe early on. Um, and as a, a school district, we made a decision to, to close on Friday um, the 13th. And we didn't close on that particular day because we were um, concerned about Friday the 13th. It just happened that that was the day we closed. Um, and basically, we closed just to give um, us time as a leadership team to think about, okay, what are our next steps? What information do we have? Um, and then um, working in collaboration with our dis district physician, Dr. Medina, and our wellness co coordinator, Mary Ellen Duggan, and our local officials, we made a decision to close for a period of two weeks. Um, and during that two-week period, we really um, thought about how we could continue learning as best possible with the realization that it was impossible to replicate what happens in our school buildings with our teachers on a day-to-day -day basis. So fortunately, we have amazing educators, uh, wonderful staff who came together, coalesced around this idea of Ennisboro Connect 1.0, um, and basically tried to create some structures for family. At the time, it was optional, it was giving families optional uh, learning um, choices. Um, and we were engaged in optional learning experiences for about two weeks. Um, and then we learned that um, the governor, uh, Charlie Baker, closed schools across the Commonwealth, our school buildings across the Commonwealth until May 4th. And we received some guidance from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education around um, creating more continuity and consistency in terms of programming for our students. So we, um, we went to 2.0 mode. So we went to Ennisboro Connect 2.0, and we worked across our three communities, Northboro, Southboro, and the region to create really a coordinated um, plan, um, more real-time learning sessions using tools like Skype and Zoom and Google Classroom. Um, 
and also looking at what are the priority learning standards that we want to try to accomplish um, through the time we knew we were being closed, which was May 4th. And that was where we were for um, several weeks up until May 4th. And the governor again extended the closure for uh, the well being of the greater good through the end of the year. And um, we'll continue in Ennisboro, with Ennisboro Connect 2.0. We did survey families, faculty, staff, and students to see what their experiences are. We got a lot of great data, a lot of great participation. And basically, the themes were. Um, that that families are really experiencing are really uh, challenged trying to work from home, be the teachers of their uh, sons and daughters, and trying to manage life. So that was one theme, which we I think all of our educators are are living that experience as well. The second theme that emerged was really don't change too much um, from May fourth to June sixteenth, which is our last day of school. That they're just getting into routines. And that to upend those routines would be counterproductive. And then the last thing that really emerged was uh, more real-time connection. So more use of Skype and Zoom and Google um, Google Meet to try to have um, teachers interact with students in real time. That that was really beneficial. So that's where we are today. Um, we are we are trying to do the best in a very difficult situation. And I, I would, again, any chance I get to applaud our educators, faculty, and staff for the great work they've done. Um, it's impressive. Um, I couldn't be more proud. It's not perfect. Um, and we've learned a lot just through this whole entire process. Greg, I'm sure that um, you know you're having to cope with with being at home as well. You know, and I'm I'm a librarian. I'm I'm uh, you know working with my staff remotely. It, it's challenging managing and and kind of communicating um, remotely, isn't it? That that brings its own set of challenges. And you have I don't know how many you know teachers and and, and other and principals and and staff that you're trying to communicate. You must be having Zoom meetings all day long. <laughs> yeah, so we so across our three districts, we have 850 employees, um, and you know we're we're an educational organization, um, which is also a business. So there are the business functions that go along with our our system. So it really um, we really had to pivot quickly and and take all of our business operations from payroll, recruiting and hiring, HR, health insurance. Um, and, and shift that into the virtual world, which we were able to do. Um, so central office has been primarily, um, we have specific office hours um, that are very limited. We have very restrictions around when people can come in and, and in and out of the office. Uh, but primarily we've shifted to remote operations and haven't missed um, a beat, which is um, again, a testament to the employees and the people who work at central office. I've, um, you know, typically, um, the thing that I really miss is the interactions. I mean, I, I would, one thing I took for granted were all those um, small conversations, those interactions that I would have, whether walking the hallways or visiting the buildings. I really miss that. Um, I miss having an idea and stepping outside of my office and asking uh, my executive assistant what she thought about it and hearing her, that's a terrible idea. Why would you even do that? Um, I, I really miss those types of interactions because it's it's the way I work. I process with the people around me and we do a lot of group thinking. Um, in Zoom, we've had a, a lot of Zoom meetings. We've tried to keep structures in place as best poss possible and um, it's the next best thing to meeting in person. Um, we've tried to make it work. I've logged a lot of seat hours in the chair that I'm sitting in today, <laughs> and my coffee consumption has risen, I think, uh, twofold. So, Mine as well. <laughs> so, but we're, we're trying to make the best of it. Yeah. Arthur? Uh, Chris, Chris, can I just ask a ask a question? Yeah. I've been, and by the way, I'm, I'm Greg, I'm kind of with you. I was just talking to one of my, my, my uh, partners today we're all working virtually, but he have I actually spend a lot of time in the office because no one else is there now, yes. right? Because they're all virtual. But I, I, I told him, I said, I said, you know, I thought of myself as a shy person, yeah. but I, uh, I find myself out so missing 
just some of those interactions, just conversations with people and being able to bounce things off of people, you know, where I think we're all, and I know Chris is, Chris is a, a you know, I, I don't think of Chris as a shy person. So I, I can I can just tell, you know, he's just really dying to get back. But but I, my question is, I, I, so I was just reading a, an article actually in The Economist uh, last week where they were really advocating in Britain for trying to get the schools back open because they said the price to the society of not having the kids educate, educated in some ways outweighs some of the, the horrendous, you know, the, the, some of the, 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 the terrible medical stories because yeah. it's so important. So, but, but going to you, you and the other educators must be thinking about this all the time. Like how, how do you deal between now and in the end of June with this kind of missing education? And how do you, how do you start thinking about how you deal with it next year? as you find a whole cohort of people who are like, you know, two months behind, three months behind, how do you, how do you think about that? So I think first, uh, just a general comment, you know, we, um, we put great faith in our medical experts and, um, you know, we're, you know, at the state level, at the local level, we have Dr. Medina, who's our district physician, who has provided outstanding guidance and leadership. You know, we work closely in partnership with our town administrator, um, John Kader, who's, been, you know, our police chief, uh, Chief Liver and Chief Parenti. And um, we really lean on their expertise in terms of deciding what's safe or not. Um, so I think in the other, so that's one important message is that, you know, we're not the medical experts. We're, we're following the lead of those, those um, professionals. In terms of, you know, we do, we are concerned, you know, we, we are a public education system where we are responsible for educating all students who walk through our doors. Um, and we have a continuum of learners in our system um, uh, in terms of what their needs are, um, what their skills are, what their social emotional well-being. Um, and it's very difficult to replicate, again, that in this virtual setting. Um, we do believe that we're very fortunate as a community. We have um, students who come to our to our school our schools on a typical day, who are well prepared, um, who have great family supports and structures at home, who come with a lot of wealth of experiences outside of their educational setting, whether it's taking vacations or going to museums or coming to the library. Um, so we feel like. Parents, education is not all lost because our school doors are open. The kid students are still learning. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just learning about different things at this point in time. I, w right now, we're in the phase of we've launched Ennisboro Connect 2.0. We're making minor adjustments, and we're really in into the, the planning phases, as you mentioned, Arthur, thinking about, okay, you know, what what do we need to think about in terms of opening our doors in the fall? Um, what types of uh, information do we need to um, collect from our students and our families? When students enter, we need to do some type of assessment to see where they are in terms of learning, um, you know, what they've missed, where the gaps are, um, and then put plans forward so that we can mitigate any of those gaps. Um, I also think we're thinking um, a lot about the social well and emotional well-being of our students that for many of our students, um, particularly at the early elementary age, they, they don't really understand why. <laughs> like uh, their world changed quickly. So we're um, also making sure that not only are we assessing where students are academically, but uh, emotionally and socially so that we can support them. As well as our faculty and staff, this has been very traumatic for them too in, in terms of um, it's, it's, it's been challenging. We're waiting for some guidance from um, the CDC provided some guidance to school districts um, a few weeks ago. Um, we're waiting for more information from the governor <coughs> um, May, around the May 18th closure. And we're working very closely with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and um, our, we'll put plans in place to reopen in the fall um, in, a, in a manner that meets the guidelines, whatever those are. Um, so we're, it's, this is not ending anytime soon. Typically at this time of year, like most departments, we have our budgets approved. 
we're really thinking about transitioning. Um, we're transitioning students out of a school year. Our educators are transitioning into FY the next school year, the fall. We're typically doing things like class placement. Um, we're, we're thinking about um, student transitions, making sure that the receiving teachers know their students that they're receiving. There's a tremendous amount of work that goes into preparing for next year that starts early and in March. So that's all happening remotely. And we're finding ourselves in, you know, we're, we're having to revisit our budgets. You know, we're having to rethink about town meeting and what impact this COVID-19 experience is um, may have on our budgets. And we're rethinking that as well. So a lot of planning and preparation. And now we're really thinking about uh, operations and how we're going to resume operations and meet the needs of our students and families. Thanks, thanks, thanks for give, thanks, Chris, for yeah. giving me that chance for that. Th and thank it's, you. Thank it's you very it's much. a tremendous amount of work, Greg. And I and I I know you know there's so much happening behind the scenes. I know that you're also on a I think the emergency management team along with the police chief, the fire chief, John Coderre, and others. And I know there's a lot of you know plans that are being put in place, and obviously different scenarios that are being planned out based on what the the new normal looks like. Um, Greg, just a question about grading. I think I heard that grades are now, is everything going to pass fail for the time being? Yes, so um, it's pass or fail, The um, and I don't have the specific details in front of me, but um, and the quarters are being weighted, so it's not, it's not as if, um, you know, the period of time that students were out, it counts for the exact same time that they were in session in September right. through March. Um, and again, it's, um, we're thinking about, you know, what impact is this pass or fail going to have on GPAs and, and sure. um, all, all those factors that really are meaningful, primarily at the, at the middle and high schools. Um, but I think the high school leadership team has put a plan forth. Again, these plans are not ideal by any means. It's just trying to make make do uh, make the best of, of um, not a great situation. Um, so we're we're. We've just actually this on Monday, we, the high school rolled out their plans for grading for the remainder of the year. Um, and it's primarily a pass or fail um, scenario, yep. um, which is difficult for high school seniors. I mean, it's and yeah. see our seniors, it's difficult for all our teachers, actually all students at the high school. Yeah. And, and then just logistical things. I mean, some kids, I'm hoping, you know, they have Internet access at home, hopefully. And also, um, you know, a Chromebook or some technology, so they're able to remotely connect, right? I, w w was yes. there a program so that the, um, the kids that yeah. didn't have Chromebooks were able to get some? So we have, um, so we're, fort well, we're fortunate. We so we have our North Reading transportation. So we have thirty, a fleet of thirty-two buses that um, that transport our students on a typical day that are sitting in a lot. Um, so we have taken advantage of those buses and we have um, we've been implementing a technology distribution. So families who needed additional Chromebooks or didn't have technology, um, we've partner, partnered with our technology department, North Reading Transportation, and have delivered those. For families who um, do not have Internet access, we um, we do have systems where we've provided um, hot spots so they can access the internet. Um, and then for some families, um, you know, again, the diversity of our families, um, you know, the technology wasn't uh, appropriate. So we've looked at um, providing some hard, you know, packets of information to, to families. You know, we, as a community of Northboro, we are becoming more diverse. So we, you know, the number of families who speak multiple languages um, is significant in our school age population. And that's something that our English language director has been uh, working uh, with as well. And food services has also been a major component. We've continued um, providing families who um, need food lunches. Um, so we, our cafeteria staff have been working. They deliver food on um, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays to provide two lunches. We have across the three districts, I believe, over 350 families who utilize um, lunch services. And again, that's through the great work of our food services team, our nurses, and um, North Reading Transportation. 
That's incredible. And and over the summer, Greg, we had uh, Pat and Skip Doyle on last week from the Rotary. I, I'm sure you're yes. familiar with them. Yeah. They talked about the Nutrition 68 program. So they're going to continue to support those who have uh, a food uh, need over the summer. Yeah, the, the Rotary has been outstanding partner with the um, the community and the Nutrition 68 has been on a good a good year in normal settings. It's been a tremendous program. Um, and a well-needed program for many of our families. And um, their work during this pandemic has, has been outstanding and um, greatly appreciated. And we are also seeing an uptick of families who are in need. You know, so we're seeing an increase of requests for lunches, also for participation in Nutrition 68. Um, so those, those types of safety nets for our community um, are essential. And um, and again, I just want to thank the Rotary and the work that they've done um, proactively to start this program two years ago is, has helped uh, tremendously. Fantastic. Arthur? That's a, that's a big deal. That, I was just going to say that's such a big deal. And it, 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 I, I suppose, as we so often have seen Chris and I doing these shows, the silver lining of this is, is, to, is to watch how people have risen to this occasion, how people are working together you know, like like what you're doing with the school buses, mm -hmm. you know, how you're just using the resources that you have to adapt to a different different situation. I just I had kind of what just a, a broad question there. there I, we find so many people who are really willing to help right now, whether mm -hmm. it's financially or with people, things and whatever. Is there is there anything special that you can see at now or going forward where you see, you know, people might be willing to help? Because one of the things that we've, well, it, as a as a kind of a sidebar, we had the Do the Doyles. That's quite a couple. Yes. Quite a couple, <laughs> right. And and they were really speaking to the fact that Rotary itself has come to realize that it's a business organization, but also one where they encourage many retired people because that's the kind of source of not only wealth but just you know you know talent and a whole bunch of things. So, you know, so just wondering if, you know, for the people who are watching the show or for others, you know, if, if there's a place that, you, that they may be able to help. Yeah. So, so yes, I, I agree that the Doyles are quite the couple um, and do amazing work. I, you know, so we don't have any formal types of um, avenues or vehicles to take in donations. So our message has been, you know, if you want to, um, if a community member wants to support, you know, support the food pantry, uh, support the Rotary. Um, there are a lot of organizations that really um, benefit our students and families. Um, and the other aspect I would say is our schools are also um, conducting food drives to support the food pantries. The Proctor Elementary School had a food drive, I believe a couple of weeks ago and the, the resp community response was amazing. Um, and and that directly goes to the food bank, which then directly goes back to um, our students, our families, and our, our citizens. So that would be my um, recommendation, is if um, a, a citizen sees an invitation to be part of some type of food drive that um, a school is doing, they're more than welcome to join. If not, um, you know, the Rotary has been such a, you, we've had so many organizations in our community that have supported the work of, of of education in the school system. Great. Thank Arthur, you. May, may, yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I was just going to ask, Greg, you know, you, you mentioned seniors earlier. I mean, we're all a feeling for the seniors. I remember when I was 18 and getting ready to go out into the world and, and looking forward to graduation. So how are we going to do graduation this year? Any, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I feel terribly for our um, Algonquin seniors this year. And I'm hoping that they're the only class that ever has to experience a pandemic. Um, so in a typical year, the months of March, April, May, June are about um, celebrating the great work of the class of 2020, um, having events, senior balls, award ceremonies, um, and an opportunity for our seniors um, to say goodbye to one another and to thank faculty and staff and for faculty and staff to say goodbye. So all of those, and it culminates in, in a graduation where the entire community comes together in a, a wonderful ceremony um, to culminate 
of the senior uh, experience pre-K through 12. So unfortunately, we because of um, the restrictions and the guidelines and, and uh, putting safety first, we can't have those types of events. Our senior class advisors, the students and, um, and the, the faculty and staff senior advisors, it's Emily Philbin and Angela Mall, working in partnership with the leadership team, Dr. Sarah Walsh, Andy McGowan, Tim McDonald, um, and Kathy Carmignani have put together the next best type of plans. They move some of their events to virtual um, and the senior class, the faculty class advisors have created a special package for every senior and those will be delivered to each senior. Um, in addition to that, there's going to be a kind of a, a drive through opportunity. <laughs> so over the course of a few days, um, we're inviting a family to um, drive to Algonquin. Um, there will be a police help and, and so forth, the details, and they'll drive up. There'll be a stage set up where it will be as formal. They could, the senior will get out of the car, wow. walk across the stage. Um, photographs can be taken. Um, we're, we're, we'll have flowers. We're hoping to have some music playing. The student's name will be announced. The student will get back in the car and drive off. Boy. So, um, so that's one of the ways we're trying to recreate what was lost. Um, and then the second thing that will uh, that is happening is uh, NCAT um, is going to be creating a virtual uh, video graduation. So, there is plans to have a video graduation with the the speeches and um, all the typical components of a, gra a celebration or graduation. And that will be shared with families on June 30th. Um, and we've had a lot of pressure around having a graduation in August, um, early August. And um, we're making a decision not, not to move forward with those plans. We understand parents um, sense of loss and wanting that. I have a daughter who's a senior in high school. I live in Shrewsbury. I, I can empathize. I would love to nothing more than to attend a graduation. But to do that with 350 uh, students and families um, in August, in the middle of a field, um, I, in talking with Dr. Medina, um, Mary Ellen Duggan, I uh, I do not feel we can do that safely, and I've made the decision not to, to have that event. Um, so what we are hoping to do, though, is um, the day after Thanksgiving um, in November, um, kind of monitor this this the environment to see what's happening and, and maybe have a, a more formal event the day after Thanksgiving in a traditional manner. And again, depending on what, you know, what we were allowed to do and, in terms of safety. Boy, so the, Chris, this has just been a really, I think, educational for a lot of folks who are, who are at home. I think also for a lot of seniors, our seniors, right? Yeah. When you said, you know, it's gone, people of seniors have gone through a lot. Or I was thinking, well, <laughs> of course, there that means something different on this show yes, sometimes. So does. to give people a sense of what a lot of people are going through and how, once again, the community is right is is really you know rising up to the occasion to help deal with all of this. So Absolutely. so thank you, thank you, Chris, for for once again finding a great <laughs> guest for us. Thank you very much, um, Greg Martineau, for 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 stopping in. Once again, we'll we'll let you know how your reruns do on this. <laughs> on the... <laughs> and so, uh, right. thank you all. Thank you I all shouldn't expect watching. paparazzi taking my photograph <laughs> when I go to Lowe's Market. That'll right? be the test. That'll be okay. the test when they're Greg, following you into, into Shrewsbury, right? Yes. That'll be the test. Greg, so, I look uh, forward to the. I was just going to say, Greg, I look forward to the day when the three of us can get together in real time. And, and talk about you know maybe next November uh, talk about the the graduation event and uh, and thank you for all your work and and the library's been working with you and and your uh, you know your your amazing principals and and, and our librarians and and so thank you so much uh, for your time Greg really appreciate I'd, it I'd like to thank the two of you for the opportunity and also thank the community of Northboro um, for all support of the school department and system we have. Um, amazing students, amazing families, amazing educators. So 
there's a lot to be proud of that I too long the day that we can uh, bring back a sense of normalcy to the work that we do. Thank coming you. Coming soon. Yeah. Coming soon. Thank yeah. you folks for watching and we'll see you uh, in the next installment of Frank and Mary here in Northboro, the COVID-19 edition. Thank you very much.